this again for all me. I appreciate it. I can't believe a lot of people get to see tonight. This is a very exciting to me and very touching. Thank you very much for coming here. Uh, the little bit of a slideshow of the guys are being run by my wife back there, Naomi Shalit, and next to my publisher, George Gears, a good, good Dover man, not born here, but loves Dover. And I thank George for get, making sure this book got Ask published. Nicely. Ask him nicely. <laughs> I, 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 I did. I asked her very nicely. Yeah. Yeah. The, the beginning, the, the beginning of the book, uh, Pat says, if anything isn't right here, it's not my fault. I'm old. My memory's lapsed. Uh, right. It, it's a big disclaimer. You don't have to shut up. No. <laughs> some of you, some of you read this book. And, and so thanks for coming anyhow. And you'll hear me read some things you read before. And I'll ask uh, do some questions and answers later at this time. I'm going to read, if you know, part of this book is about my grandmother, Rosie, many of you know, and it's the Armenian section. I'm going to deal with a little bit of that at the end, but mostly I'm going to be talking about read from a couple of Dover sections of the book because I'm in Dover and you're here. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, this is a great short story by Dylan, Tom, Dylan Thomas, the, a Welsh writer, sorry, he's not Irish, called The Child's Christmas in Wales. You might have heard it and seen it. And in it, he has this great description of, of a Christmas party. And, and he says, there are always uncles. And there are always uncles in our lives. And one of them is my Uncle Licky. And this is a chapter called A Man Named Licky. Weirdly, we just had an ice cream in a place called Licky's. Yeah. Different yes. Licky. I'll explain this in a minute. I worked with Licky. Oh. I dove a nose. Oh, you, oh well, you, you might like this chapter then. <laughs> I liked Licky. I did too. Uh, that's me and... and, and uh, I'm the, I'm the older one there. Look, he's the middle one, obviously. And my brother Gary is there, a little shy. And uh, this, is, this is going back when I was much younger. I am 10 or 11 years old, riding shotgun in a delivery van. And the man at the wheel is singing a Sinatra tune while tailgating the car in front of us. This alone is enough to tell you that it is not my father driving, which he did cautiously and in silence. The man at the wheel is my uncle, an uncle out of the book of uncles, an uncle like the cigar smoking uncles in a Welsh parlor. The uncle that every good boy should have so we can see how to be one of the guys. Fairy tales can come true, it can happen to you if you're young at heart, he croons as we cross Dover's upper square on a summer evening. He is my young at heart uncle, the uncle whose role models are not priests or saints, but men like Frank Sinatra and Harry S. Truman. Where my father was a sober example of manly self-sacrifice, decency, and reliability, Uncle Licky, from his exotic nickname to his lifelong bachelorhood, showed me how to be another kind of man. My uncle was the closest thing we had in, had, to, had to Rat Pack carriages in Dover circa 1960. Stephen Licky Banyan was not slender or a jaunty fedora like Sinatra, but he was short, stocky, and swarthy, so dark that his nickname from childhood was Licorice Stick. Later shot to Licky, and to his very best friends, he was just plain Lick. They didn't look the part, but he and his bachelor pals constituted a local version of Sinatra's gambling, boozing, and womanizing pals. Licky, light, Licky and friends drank hard stuff at the Elks Club, gambled at the track, played golf, rented a beach house in the summer where the parties were local legend, wore snazzy shirts, and adopted an air of insouciance. Although I'm not sure with their high school educations or less, they even knew what that word meant. To be the worldly men they wanted to be, even in northern New England mill town, where the most worldly thing they ever saw was a pocket handkerchief, they talked like they had seen it all, even if they hadn't. They were men of no doubts, their opinions firm, expressed with finality. Harry S. Truman, he'd say, you know what the S stands for, Johnny? He asked me more than once, never waiting for my reply. Nothing, Johnny, nothing. It seemed to please Uncle Licky that Truman was the kind of man who couldn't be bothered with a middle name. Best president, no contest, dropped the bottom bomb on the Japs. He had guts. You know what he said, right? The buck stops here if you can't take the heat out of the kitchen. He admired Truman to the point of having a tailor make him an overcoat modeled after the one Truman was often seen wearing. I'm a leg man, he told me when I was older. <laughs> Some guys go for the other stuff, he said, figuring as a young man I would know what the other stuff was. He was disappointed in me when I brought a girlfriend home to meet the family. Her legs are too skinny, he told me later with the understated suggestion I'd do better the next time. One day we were driving to a family picnic in the Chevy, which prompted him to give me a singular advice about car maintenance. You know they tell you to change the oil in your car every so many miles? 
it's a scam. I never change the oil in my car. If it's low, I put it in a quart. There's no point in spending all that moolah to change it. It's oil, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> Do you like ketchup and everything from cottage cheese to ice cream? And we'd be glad to prove it to you. If you didn't like something, you always said the same thing. That's my idea of nothing at all. He had only one meal a day, dinner. The rest of the day, he subsisted on coffee and cigarettes. Except for a short stint in the army, he lived his whole life with his mother, my nana, Rosie, to you. He took care of her. He never learned to drive. She never learned to drive a car. So Licky, or my mother, or Ami Mae, my Aunt Mary, I call her Ami Mae, would drive Nana to her errands. And she took care of his, their apartment and cooked for him. Each night, she would make him one of her great meals, stuffed grape leaves, or pork chops, or lamb and green beans. At the end of the meal, it was her habit to assess the quality on a dollar basis. As he rose from the kitchen table, Nana would wait his work. A buck 89, ma. 250, ma. A buck and a half, ma. And her, her reply was always the same. She exclaimed his Armenian name, Stefan, and slapped him across the head. <laughs> he walked like a bow legged John Wayne, a slow rolling gait. His arms hung from, away from his torso, curved and muscle bound, ready to pick up a bundle of newspapers in each hand and swing them onto the delivery van he drove each night. Many evenings right after dinner, I would go with him on one of his runs, listening to him singing Young at Heart as he drove one of those trucks loaded with the late edition Boston newspapers. Uncle Licky's place at work was Dover News, a distribution center for Boston and New York newspapers, magazines, comic books, and paperback books. After being delivered to the Dover News warehouse on 3rd Street, where it was at the time, the, all those bundles will be broken down in, into smaller bundles, head up in newsstands and convenience stores throughout New Hampshire and parts of Maine. All day long and into the evening, the bundles of record Americans and New York Times and newspapers and Life and Post magazines and Sergeant Rock and Batman comics and paperbacks with lurid covers loaded into vehicles destined for a newsstand in Sanford, Maine, a neighborhood market in Dover, a coffee shop in Durham, frequented by professors from the University of New Hampshire. Uncle Licky was a shop foreman, but he also dug in and did the hands-on work. He'd schedule the drivers and bundlers, coordinate the orders he got from the office girls with the work of the warehouse floor, hire and fire, and when the day's work was supposed to be done, he'd run the last route of the day himself, which is usually where I came in. He'd double park in front of the store, grab a stack of newspapers, hurry into the store, and drop the papers on the counter. That took a minimum of one or two minutes, and then on to the next stop. Sometimes, Lucky wanted to do the evening route a little faster and get to wherever he was going that night, the elk to the track, so he recruit me to help him. When we got to the stop, he'd hand me a stack of papers, and I was to run it as fast as possible, drop the papers, and get back in the van. I took it as a challenge and a game and a way to show off to my uncle. While he was driving too fast, he'd, count with his, he'd take his right hand and count out the stack of papers from the center console and then hand them to me. Just as he pulled up to the store, but before he came to a complete stop, I'd open the door and get ready to leap out, zigzag between cars, likely cut off a customer to the store, slap the stack on the counter and speed back to the car or the van, leaping into the front seat and closing the door just as Licky sped off. Seven seconds, Johnny, not bad, Uncle Licky pronounced when I got back to the van. You can do better than the next stop. I doubt he really timed me, but the fact that he was never all that impressed with me was a different, different experience from what I had at home. Licky didn't think he needed to go easy on me, didn't see me as an antidote to the Armenian genocide that had killed the grandfather he never met. Licky seemed to have put all of that in the compartment and then gone on to be a full-fledged American, even if he had to accept and embrace the fact that his foreign complexion was so defining it literally changed his name. When I was in college, Licky gave me a paying job at Dover News. I came to the warehouse right after dinner every Saturday night. Trucks and vans were parked inside, long folding tables with scarred wooden tops lined the concrete floor, lit by a series of large bare bulbs hanging from the ceiling rafters. It smelled of millions of tons of sulfurous newsprint that had passed into and out of the warehouse over the years. I was dabbling in journalism in college, but had no way of knowing then that newsprint, the cheap paper on which every newspaper ever has been printed, would someday, be, someday become the canvas on which my whole life would be painted. The work started on the tables, where we lined up the different sections of the Boston Sunday newspapers that arrived in the past couple of days. The sections that are not filled with breaking news and sports are printed ahead. Sections like the weekly magazine, the comics, lifestyle, business, etc. Every Saturday evening, 
the live sections arrived. But as I learned then, no one wants their Sunday papers in six different pieces. The pieces have to be put together into one package, a job called stuffing or inserting. Late on Saturday, the final sections, news and sports, showed up, and we inserters put the various pieces together in one package with the front section, page one on the outside. We lined up the Boston Globe sections in front of us, a stack of feature sections, a stack of advertising flyers, etc. news and sports. We shuffled quickly along the line, working as fast as possible, grabbing each section, and then opening up the final section and shoving the other sections in it. Licky supervised all of us, and when we got behind, he'd stand at a table and show us how it was done. He could do a row in three or four seconds, his right hand grabbing sections and his left hand reaching at the same time for the final section. Swish, 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 and slap the completed package. When the Boston papers were ready, they were loaded onto a large delivery truck driven by one of the full-time employees. I helped load the truck and went along to do just what I did when I was 10 years old, get the news to the storefronts as fast as possible. When the run was over, we'd get back to the warehouse, and by then, all the other inserters had gone home. The last sections of the New York Times had arrived while I was doing the Boston run paper, and was left, and was left just to me to stuff the copies of the Times, load them onto a van, and deliver them. I had started around 7 p.m., and by now it was 7 or 8 a.m., and my long shift would end when I finished the Times run. I was grateful for the job and the 30 bucks or so I made each week, but I was even more gratified by the compliment that Uncle Licky, prototype in my mind as a man about town, had enough confidence in me to have me work alongside him and the other regulars and trust me to do that final run of the week. Week after week, including many who had to maneuver the van through New Hampshire snowdrifts, nothing ever went wrong. The right number of times went to the correct stores at the correct times. The van was returned to the shop undamaged, the shop was locked and secured for reopening on Monday. Licky was the one adult in my family who expected something from me. He expected me to run fast, have a girlfriend with great legs, to be into, into what the other stuff a woman is made of, to be able to imagine what went on in Las Vegas, to keep up with working men, to drive a delivery van in any weather, even expecting me to sing and remind myself to be young at heart, like he was. Now this section involves some people here who know what actually happened, it will ask them to just keep it to themselves. That's pretty close. <laughs> uh, right across the street is City Hall. And this chapter is, uh, oh, City. Yes, right. <laughs> City Hall. City Hall picture. Thank you. Ah, right. City Hall. There's City Hall. Thank you. I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> City Hall and Jim. Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, this is a title called Mrs. Mack drove the getaway car. And uh, it also begins with a quote from Dylan Thomas. Uh, they are playing Indians of the evening. I was aware of myself in the exact moment living of a middle of a living story. My body was my adventure and my name. When we were kids, we just lived. We didn't think. Every night, I'd have supper with mom and dad and Gary, run through my homework, walk down Hindler Avenue, take a ride at Wallingford Street, and there, Right at the curb next to the basketball court was the little bungalow of the McEnany family, the Max. At home, everything was the same. Day after day, night after night, after supper and cleanup, dad drove downtown to get the Record American, the Boston Evening Tabloid newspaper, and spent the night in his easy chair with his one nightly glass of Kruger ale and a lucky strike. Mom had a Pall Mall on the breezeway, probably reading Life Magazine or Reese Digest. Gary was watching TV not far from my father, there was no discussion of a plan to wreck habit in the neighborhood or shock the upright people. But down at the max, normality was their nemesis. A memorable phrase I read in the Gate to Lease History of the New York Times. At that point in my life, normality was about all I knew. What I didn't know about myself was how I would respond to peers who laughed at the straight line we were supposed to be work, walking. In the early, 1960, the early 1960s were not yet the 60s. It was not yet a time of general rebellion and anti this and anti that, especially in, in New Hampshire, where trends showed up late and kind of stale. But Mac didn't need a Time Magazine cover story to tell him the age of rebellion had arrived. He seemed to have been born wanting to, wanting to knock the hat off Mr. Respectability. And he'd, just, he'd get just a big laugh, he could walk past Mr. Respectability the next day, wearing the hat, and then return it to him with a sly smile. 
There was never an announcement that we would, we would be the contrarians of Dover, New Hampshire. No manifesto declaring we were seceding from propriety. It was just Max saying to us, as waited in anticipation for the next adventure, I've got a notion. One of his notions was a reaction to something called Club 96. Club 96 was the invention of the local radio station, a weekly dance at Dover City Hall for the good kids. The other 4%, it was implied, were the juvenile delinquents. <laughs> Teenagers who drove, stole cars, started fistfights, and played hooky from school. Picture a 17-year-old boy with a pomade ducktail haircut, black leather boots, a sneer, and a dangling cigarette. That was a 4%. But that was not Mac. And that was my, not the rest of his gang. Mac didn't want to be a punk or a hood. Nothing about that was cool or took any imagination. He saw the kind of society that would come with a Club 96 as the kind of society that needed a poke in the eye. We were not the 96%, nor were we the hoodlums in the 4%. We were another category altogether, a category we defined ourselves. We were the provocateurs, the irreverent ones. We'll crash your party, but we won't trash a place like the 4% would. No, we'll sneak in early, deflate the balloons, drink all the punch, and hide the folding chairs in the boiler room. I'd knock on Mac's door, and if there, was just a, if there was, wasn't a plan to foot yet, they were reliving the last hijinks. And just as likely, the mother, Mrs. Mac, was right in the middle of it. Mrs. Mac, Catherine was raising five kids on her own, husband having died just before I came on the scene. He had left them a small insurance policy in the house. She had a low paying job, chambermaid at the local motel off the new highway on the edge of Dover. She was a hard working church going woman who insisted all her kids do well in school and go to college, which they did, a tribute to their native smarts and her determination. The sons became an insurance executive, an economist, a wildlife biologist, and a developer, surveyor, and one daughter head of a state agency. But inside that stalwart woman of the working class was the same hellion that was inside Mac. She had the same complexion as my Irish father, so translucent it was ruddy from the veins in their faces. But where dad's countenance was placid and stoic, hers twinkled with mischief. 50 years after our gang had grown up and many of us had moved on, I got in touch with Mac and his younger brother, Kevin, and we talked over coffee at Kevin's home in Dover. I asked Mac to explain his mother, a mother lot not like any other mother in the neighborhood. He said her and his siblings grew up on a farm and they got to do pretty much what they wanted. My mother, he said, wasn't very old when she got married, probably 21 or 22. And I think her attitude was, she's a widow with five kids and you can try to control five kids, but you probably can't. And as long as they're doing well in school and not getting into big trouble, then that was the best she could do. Ed Max said, I think the other thing on her mind was, was that if things would come up and sounded like fun, she'd want to do them. So when it came to act on Mac's notion about Club 96, Mrs. Mac was the obvious choice to be the wheelman in the operation. The radio station had been announcing all week that the winners of the Club 96 dance con contest would win the largest pumpkin ever grown in the state. Since this is one of the few stations we could tune in on our car radios, we've been hearing the announcement all week as she cruised around Dover with Mac driving his mother's 57 Green Plymouth. He had just gotten his license. The rest of us were a year or so younger. The day before the dance, hearing the promise of the big pumpkin giveaway one more time, Max said, that's what they think. We're going to take that pumpkin away from them right before their eyes. We got back to his house. Mark, Max started handy, laying out the plan. It was like watching one of those World War II movies where there's a character to represent every stereotype in the American melting pot. In Dover, there was not that much ethnic variety, but Mac, playing the part of the Ivy Leaguer in the group, had a range of personalities and body types to choose from. And as he began, I realized what he chose for me would tell me a lot about who he thought I was. Since I wasn't so sure of that yet myself, I welcomed this assessment. It Leslie left me out and gave me an assignment that was the equivalent of playing right field. Okay, here's the deal, he said, as we gathered in the family's living room, the half dozen boys and two females, his 15-year-old sister and his 41-year-old mother. We're going to distract the cops and the DJ, and when they're not looking, we'll grab that pumpkin and run down the back stairs with it. My mother will be there with the car, and we'll get away before they know what happened. Now, everyone will have a job to do. Cricket and Spence, you two start off by going up to, to the DJ and get them looking away from the pumpkin. Cricket was David Crockett, and Spence was Tom Spencer. Cricket had been given his first name be before the movie Davy Crockett came out. But that's what we had, but we, so he still went by the name Cricket. And he was the most all-American looking guy we had in the group. 
Spence was the closest thing we had to a four percenter. He had his near, that his name, that's one name that's been changed, but you know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't check with him, so I had to change his name. Spence is the closest thing we had to a four percenter in the group. He had his near albino haircut and a flat top, uh, flat top when he was a boy, and it stayed that way until the last time I saw him, which was when he was around 60. His slouch seemed to be saying to his teachers, hell no, I will not stand up straight. He was the only one of us to smoke cigarettes. Smoking was a sign of rebellion back then, but not our kind of rebellion. It was too obvious. Minnie and Boris said, Matt, I want you two to start a fight in the lobby to distract the cop they have at the door. Minnie was John Miniter. Boris was my nickname, after Boris Badenov, a portly and bumbling Russian spy in the Rocky and Bullwinkle show, a satirical cartoon featuring a talking moose, which is one of our favorites. Matt gave everyone names from the show. Mine was the only one that stuck. I didn't look like Boris Badenov. I was more gangly than stout, but I did have a slightly dark complexion, and maybe it was the Armenian in me that prompted the nickname. Armenia at the time was part of the Soviet Empire, but I liked it. Boris was exotic, offbeat, and gave me an identity in the group that was distinct from my identity at home and in school. Okay, well, you guys are distracting everyone. Me and Tebow will snatch the pumpkin and take it down to the back stairs. My mother and Barbara will be in the car and we'll meet up at the back of my house. Max said, Tebow, Terry was his next to youngest brother. Even as we were plotting this escapade, things were happening in the world. The president of South Vietnam had just escaped a coup. J. Edgar Hoover was setting up a wiretap of Martin Luther King. And in a few weeks, John F. Kennedy would be assassinated in Dallas. Harbingers, all of them, of the world we would soon be entering. A world with a war each of us would have to take part in or find a way to avoid. A world marred by racial prejudice. A fact we would not be able to ignore if we ended up leaving Lily White, New Hampshire. A world in political upheaval that would take, ask us to make a stand, right or left, liberal or conservative, involved or apathetic. All of that, the blood, the blood pooling on the jungle floor in Vietnam and standing a pink dress in Texas and spilling onto a balcony in Memphis was about to wrench at our consciousness. But that night we were just in a crazy lock, like Dylan Thomas playing Indians. We were aware only of ourselves. Tonight we were going to steal the biggest pumpkin in the state and rain on the parade of the 76%. Dover City Hall was and still is an imposing brick and granite structure. The entrance was a steep set of stairs of a 25 foot, up past the 25 foot granite columns. The clock tower and cupola were a brilliant white, topped by a golden dome. The interior was all deep, dark wood and cold stone floors. Our city hall echoed with authority, the perfect place to send our message. When we walked up the stairs to the second floor auditorium, we could hear the DJ playing one of the most saccharine songs of the year. Hey Paula, the song began. Hey Paula, I want to marry you. Inside, the girls were modest shirt dresses or party dresses with petticoats, low heels and hair and flips. The, go the boys wore beige chinos, button down shirts and checks or stripes. It was still a year or two away from the Beatles, spirit Beatles inspired long hair. No boy wore his hair more than a few inches long. We all went to the barbershop once a week. Mac had told us to wait until 8.30 to start the distraction. There was just one cop and he wasn't anyone we knew. He was young and tall it did not look easy to trick. My breathing was getting quicker, and I felt like the cop was studying me. Minnie, is this going to work? That cop is looking right at us. No, he isn't, Boris. Okay. I was worried. Will we get arrested? Will the cops call my parents? I wanted to belong, to be accepted, to be just as crazy as everyone else, but not if there were consequences. <laughs> the angelic boy in the catechism, that upright Boy Scout, that firstborn of a new generation, wanted to come, wanted to come up with an excuse to stop this thing right there. That's what Minnie pushed me hard with both hands, nearly knocking me on my ass while I yelled, hey, jerk, are you looking at me? I was so shocked I forgot this was just an act and got on my feet and tried to tackle Minnie, and soon we were rolling around on the floor. Not exactly a fist-throwing fight, but enough to scuffle that the cop come over and tell us, cut it out and get the hell out of here. We got up and ran down the steps, having caused a minute distraction at best, but at least I hadn't chickened out, even if that was what I was trying to figure out a way to do. Safely outside, we started walking to Max's house, less than, less than a mile away. When the green Plymouths went sp speeding by, did they get the pumpkin? Mrs. Mac honked the horn, and Barbara rolled down the window and whooped at us. Success. Back at Max, everyone was quiet, listening to the radio broadcast from the dance. Twelve-year-old Kevin, Kevbo as we called him, the youngest of the McEnany brothers, 
was first in the pumpkin, which was big as a chair. On the radio, they said, okay, we've got the winners of the dance contest. And he named Cindy, a girl from our neighborhood, a skinny blonde who would someday be famous in Dover for dating a second-rate major league baseball player. And her dance partner, a kid named Ricky, who wore a bow tie and white bucks to school. These two young people are part of the 76% of the good kids, and tonight they have won the biggest contest in the state. It must weigh 50 pounds. I'm going to ask the stage crew to bring it over, bring it up to the mic so we can present it to Cindy and Ricky. Ah, the DJ said with a slow hesitation. Okay, I guess we'll have to give them that to you later. It was on the stage a little while ago. <laughs> we all started laughing and screaming and rolling on the living room floor. The pumpkin was no longer just an oversized member of the squash family. Now it was a story that would live on for years, repeated every Halloween. And among the players in the tale would be the one-time Prince of Wentworth Street. No, that's me. Just up the street, a quarter mile away, my parents were ending their evening routine. The empty glass of Kruger, a residue of suds clinging to its side, sat in the sink. My mother's last lipstick stained Pall Mall had been stubbed away out in the ashtray. They did not know I had taken one more step away from, away from them, from being John Thomas Christie towards being Boris. Uh, thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, this, uh, now comes a real truth. The, 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 uh, the theme of the book is, and some of you know this because you've read it, is sort of a self-discovery. You know, we all went to Catholic school. The first question is, who made you? And in the, when you have an end of your midlife crisis, like many of us had, I have had, you start asking that question seriously, and you go back and you find out, well, who, you know, we know, we know the catechism answer, God made us, but we know in truth that our friends and our family made us, and, I, and the history of our family made us. And so I wanted to find out our history, and that's when, you know, I'd heard that my grandmother, Rosie Banyan, there was an, I mean, there was a genocide, and she escaped, and I didn't know much about it. And a lot of the book is me trying to find out what happened to her and discovering that she was nine years old and living in this uh, little village in the Ottoman Empire, you know, was Syria at the time, is currently Turkey. And when she was nine years old, she was out in the field, told to gather the cows and bring them to the, to the shepherd. And a, a, a boy, a Turkish boy, now she's Armenian, not Turkish, and the Armenians are Christian, the Turkish, Turks are not, comes out to her and says, they're killing the kafir, they're killing the kafir, they're killing the infidels, the, the, the Christians. And she runs back to her home and she remembers at age 90 that as she's running back to the home, she runs through the mulberry trees. The, the mulberry trees are grown there because the leaves are fed to the silkworms and they make silk in this village. And she's running back to the trees and she remembers at age 90 those mulberry trees, leaves tickling her cheeks. So when I finally discover all of this about her, my son and I, Nick, decide the thing to do is to find her village in Turkey, which wasn't easy because we asked her where she lived. She said a place called Swidia. Well, that's like saying you're from Essex County or uh, Stafford County here. It's a bigger place. And within that, there are many villages. And, and I discovered six of the villages are typically Armenian. So one of those villages must have been hers. And through process of elimination, Nick and I discover that village. And uh, the book ends with me coming back home, having found this village, and, and, and reflecting on what happened. I'll read a little bit of that in the last chapter. When I think back and remember looking up at that wide and green valley, Tibitius, that's the name of her village, and then down to the sil silver, uh, the sliver of turquoise Mediterranean Sea, I felt anger. Life in Bithyus was likely hard work for the Hosepians, that was her maiden name. But it was home, a home surrounded by mulberry trees and fruit trees, home where their hard work and the land provided them with a place to grow much of their own food, raise cows for milk, yogurt, and cheese, bake their own bread on fire, stoked with wood they gathered. <clears throat> I was angry that my nana was forced from a home for no other reason than she was the wrong religion, the wrong ethnicity. It's a story as old as time. Sometimes it's the Christians who are disdained, humiliated, jailed, deported, killed. 
Sometimes it's the Muslims. Sometimes it's the Jews. Sometimes it's the people who are the wrong color, who wear the wrong clothes, who speak the wrong language. It's a story that never ends and goes on even today in every culture and every country. Looking up at a village, I could picture my nana there as a nine-year-old girl who went to gather the cows, who ran through a field of grass and trees, an innocent child unaware she was only months away from losing that innocence in her home forever. Her name was Galenia. That was her, 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 her army name, Galenia Hosepian, later known as Rose Banyan, later my nana. Survived another 87 years, has six children, seven grandchildren, and 10 great grandchildren. 110 years after the Ottoman Turks had come to kill the infidels of Bitias, two of those descendants, myself and Nick, a grandson and great grandson, found her home. By her presence, we have proclaimed that she survived. They could not kill her, they could not erase her or her family. We were the proof of that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't even tell you when to move, but you can figure it out. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's my son. And we, couldn't, we didn't have an address in the village. We found the village because there were the right trees there and there was the former silk factory. And this is, we figure, if it wasn't a place like this where it all happened, it, was, it wasn't this place, it was a place like this. And I took some mulberry tree uh, leaves from the tree near where her home would have been, and we came back to Dover. I, I put one of those leaves on her on a gravestone at, at Pine Hill Cemetery. So, any questions or comments? Glad to talk. I, th I think when I, I probably about age 60. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I. And the only, and the only, and I wanted to know more. And I, and as you read the book, you know, I, I couldn't find my, my aunts remembered some things. And some of you know my aunts, uh, Mary McKenney in Dover. And, you know, they knew some things. My mother passed by then, and, but they all knew that there was this tape, this recording that a cousin had made, and I didn't really know this cousin. And it took me a long time to find an aunt who knew the cousin, and I, and I couldn't find the cousin for a long time. Uh, but eventually, I, I found her and got a copy of the tape, and, and there was this, there was my aunt, my grandmother, telling her story, beginning with, you know, when she, when she was a nine-year-old girl in that village. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I would have not been able to write the book without that story. Yeah. So who had recorded that time? Uh, a, a woman named Tammy. She's not from Dover. She is the daughter of my grandmother's. She's my my grandmother would be her great aunt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She just said the fourth up. She was a, she was it was a bicentennial year, and she said, "Oh, I should learn more about my family since history's in the air." I'll go to my Aunt Rose, I hardly ever see her, and make this recording. It was kind of like a by the way kind of thing. Damn lucky. Yeah. And I, and I, the aunt, uh, the cousin, she, uh, I think at that point she lived in Tennessee. Yeah. Her, she, her, uh, her father was a professor at Vanderbilt, uh, economics professor, though he's Egyptian and came here to teach. Tom. Right. Yeah. Uh, and Rose. Yeah. I worked with her for many, many years. Really? I used to drive a big truck in the summertime to Beach Street. So I drive back yeah. and then he said, You know, he said, Tommy, he said, You think you know you to drive that truck? He said, Go get me tired ones. It's a place down by the Red Sea Bar. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. And he said, You follow me over here. He gets in the big truck, takes me off, and I'm following him. He hit the Broadway Bridge. Oh, dumb. <laughs> <laughs> he hit the... He started back up because I was running up to the bridge. Get out of here quick. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, well, that's a good, that's a typical story. Yeah. That was a dangerous bridge. It was very low. Yes, it is. It still is. It still 
Alex yeah. and still have to pay just, Right. Yeah. yeah, he should have known better, though. He drove a truck all the time. Right. <laughs> and I remember the picture of you and your brother with Flicky. That car you had, he was a 53 or 54 Ford. And I don't know if like the first car you had. That one to the right, I believe. Oh, the, to the right, yeah. Yeah. Do you know where that picture is, Pat? It's like the proper color car. And my mother, when anybody got a new car, they had to take her for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> and Licky had to take her for a ride around Dover. <laughs> she had to catch the on every new car that everybody got. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're a great family. Great neighbors. It was a great place to grow up. Yeah, a great time yeah. yeah. dead end street, we do what we wanted to. It was a dead end street. Not, it was yeah. we could. We just, it was a playground. Yeah. And so was the field. And, and Poppy's field. Poppy's field. And the picture I just showed you with Poppy's pond in the background. Which yeah. Was that was our playground. It's not cricket or apartments. But you that, put that picture up. There was a, a, a right there. Is that's that's that Terry Manning? Yeah, right there. Is that Terry McEnany? No, that's that's Jim. He went to school. Jim and I went graduated together. Okay, he's he he familiar always. looking to me. But looks I, like, it looks I, a I, little bit like Terry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he's probably what fifteen in that picture, maybe. Uh, probably. Yeah. 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 Dover was. I I lived in Dover for twenty five years, and you know it was a great place to live. I thought. I mean, it was a melting pot. I mean, we had Greeks. Syrians, Lebanese, we were French, French Irish. Yeah. I mean, it was all here, and you never really thought much about it. You know, that, I mean, that for me, it's like Court Street, where him and I grew up, <clears throat> one Street right off Court Street. It was like the League of Nations. Yeah. 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 I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. Everything, you know, the play ends. The, yeah. But they weren't, it, 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 it never, to me, there never seemed to be any issues with different no, groups. There were all the people working yeah. in the mills and they yeah. all had to yeah. get together through the yeah. depression. Yeah. Absolutely. Through the depression yeah. you know? We were all like one big family, you know, that's what I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great place to grow up. It's a good memory. Yeah, oh yeah, that, that, so that's, the, that's, that's uh, let's see, uh, Kevin, you're in here. Yeah, there's men up there with the glasses. Yeah. 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 Jeff Moe, yeah. Jerry Moe. Simone, yeah. And a hood, at least one, at least one hood in there. Your mother. Kevin, the last time I remember your father, I remember seeing and talking to him. He was putting up a, a TV antenna on top of Rosie's house. Oh. And, that, and it was like two weeks later, he, he took the ship out and passed away. Is that right? He just had. He just had a health check if he was fine, and then he was gone. But I remember that came up on the road putting up the TV. Really? And, uh, yeah. On, on I, remember the, I remember that that was the first TV I remember seeing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I still have the one that we used to look at in my house. You still have that TV? I do. Wow. <laughs> so go down there and watch. What do we watch every week? There's only one channel, I believe. Yeah, well, <laughs> we always gather the Yaros to watch Twilight Zone. Yeah, he had, he had a bad limp. Yeah. Yeah. He had the big. Charlie, Charlie Burnham. Yeah. 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 He did, he, he, the big box of tubes. Oh, well, we'd love to see him coming because he knew he was going to replace the, 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 the tubes. Tubes. Right. Yeah. Well, my father was able to get one of the first TVs in Dover because he worked putting up antennas when he passed it. And uh, so uh, I think one of his Trojans that he was working for. And, so we gave him a deal, and we gave him two TVs, and he probably got the 12-inch screen. <laughs> <laughs> right. Peggy Smith had that. And Peggy Smith worked at Dover North Shore. Peggy, yeah. That was Tom and I. Francis. Francis was there. Sherry yeah. Christie. Uh, I do. I basically, I would say that's early, mid-50s, because she's, you know, still has a little bit of dark hair, yeah. you know, and that's, yeah. if you could drive, go around to the end of that, you'd, you'd find Pat and his family around there. I know that, and that's actually really one of the dark hair along with the men. You see the cemetery yeah. in the background? Yeah, the yeah, the old burial yeah. grounds, yeah. Indian, Native American burial yeah. grounds, yeah. Rosie didn't like us until it was great for you, too. 
Those were kind of special, Tom. We had to be careful with those. He knew we were sort of starting with those. Yeah, and she had this little shack down below between, between her house and my parents' house. There yeah. Was a shack there where she'd grow the, and she had peach trees. Peach trees, too. Stuff. Yeah. Good memory. Yeah. Well, uh, it's now the cr development is called Cricket, right? Cricket Brook. Yeah. Cricket Brook. But it's still yeah. there. It's still some uh, stones are still, still there, there, Kevin. Yeah, it's you I got, got a lot of torn up trees on it. Ah, but there that was uh, that hill in the back. So. Yeah. yeah. And right at the end of that, yeah. wow. When when they built Cricket Brook, they tried to put a road down through there. And my father comes out and says, "What are you doing?" And they're saying, well, we're going to put a road there. He said, no, you're not. They said, why? He says, look, he went over and he showed them bones coming out of the ground. This is a cemetery. You cannot build this and develop it. So the police came down and shut them down. And there's still not a road there. There's a oh. Oh, yeah. I love doing that. That field, that field, we used it. Some went there. It was like it was a, we didn't have playgrounds. That was not playgrounds. You know? No, at the bottom was flat enough to play ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right in front of the hill, right. And then you have to dodge the uh, gravestone. Yeah, the yeah. But John, that, that cemetery. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, that right. cemetery, Samuel Hanson lived on Hanson Street in the, the big, by, by Century 21, if you know where the real estate company Yeah, is. yeah. That was his homestead. And Samuel Hanson owned all the land from Central Avenue all the way to the Chico River. Wow. It was a big farm, and he used to employ the Native Americans. So that's why they were, you know, allowed them to be buried in oh, the cemetery. Wow. They were not slaves, yeah. they were not they were paid yeah. employees. And, and his gravestone was there. I remember him and his wife's well, gravestone. Right. All the old well, I'm glad you're the one running the 400th anniversary because you've <laughs> got to get all this down in that book. I get it. Book. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, well here's, here's another story. Yeah, well, that's yeah, we were. We, remember, we used to play in the sand pit there. Yeah. And we decided we're going to, oh, we're going to dig foxholes. So we started digging foxholes. Then we decided we're going to build a tunnel. Well, here's all these skulls and bones and stuff. Oh, oh, so one of the kids said, I'm going to take this home. So he takes it home and he put it in a paper bag behind the stove. And his father comes over, What's that? So it's a, it's a treasure we found up digging up and went down a poppy field. And the father went, holy shit. And, and so he called the police, the police come on, they took it to UN, uh, UNH, and it was a Native American skull. You know? Aww. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, wow. just to bring him back a lot, quite a memory. So just, just a little other anecdotes there. The, the Wentworth home on the left hand side. Yeah. So George Wentworth was a real character. He was, he was a postmaster in Dover. He was uh, an unbelievable photographer and a fantastic taxidermist. A taxidermist, I remember that. Right. Yeah, yeah. My mother used to tell me stories about the cars coming with New York plates, yeah. big limousines dropping off things to be to be mounted. Oh. So, and in that house, so when it started to deteriorate, when Dewey and Art, his sons, had passed away, some of the kids would get in there and trash the thing. So Charlie Boyle, my brother Terry, and I went in. We basically broke in, but we wanted to preserve what was left before everybody get, everything got trashed. And we, we took out hundreds and hundreds of glass plates of photographs. Yeah, wow. And probably 50 or 60 original taxidermy mounts. Wow. There were three extinct birds. There was a passenger pigeon. Wow. There was a uh, Heath hen, which is a grouse from the Cape. And there was a Carolina parakeet. So all, all three of those yeah. had been extinct by the time he had mounted yeah. those. Yeah. 
Yeah. And we gave those to the Harvard Museum and, oh. and different places for, to, for them to, to, to uh, keep on display. And, and a lot of the plates that you recovered went to Tom Hindle. Oh, yeah. Tim Hindle, so he's got them? When, when you go up to one with that, hospital, yeah. you see all those old yeah. pictures. Yeah. That was yeah. old man went with took those yeah. pictures. And then one picture when uh, the president at the time uh, was at what's that, Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt came to Dover to speak. And there's a photograph of all those crowds up at the upper square. You can still see the big cross trough right. monument there. And the kids in front are Art and Dewey Wentworth. It, it, it's back, from the back side, but yeah. those, they were in that picture. Um, he didn't like us stealing his crab apples. No. Right? No, he, yeah, yeah. and he had, the, he had the classic Harley Davidson's with the saddlebags. Yeah, in 1942. right. Yeah. And he had, he had the 1910, which is, that was one of those pictures, and uh, Hindle has that, and it was Art and Dewey and a couple other guys in front of the house in 1910, uh, Indian, and that's in a museum out in Chicago. Yeah. I love this guy. This Pretty interesting. Yeah. You're hearing a lot about the crime sprees of the Megan family. Yeah. But <laughs> well, you see. They witnessed the protection uh, program. Yeah. If they weren't good at the crime, he wouldn't have saved all those old photographs and, and all those stuff. So it came in handy. Well, my mother was known as the driver when we stole pumpkins every Halloween. Yeah. It was all. It was. It was no one ever, no one ever served any time, as far as I know. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, one of the, my, my only chapters of the time, I got arrested for murder, but it, they didn't, they didn't keep me. It was attempted murder. It was justified. That's what they say. That's right. He turned out okay. Well, thanks everybody. This is, and 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 uh, if anybody wants to give a donation to the library, I will sign up. I'll give you one of these books if you haven't got one. Yeah, thank you.